Welcome back to channel everybody. I'm Nate and today we've got a continuation of our operating system security videos that we've been doing. Today we're talking about Windows. Exciting uh, news we're getting into Windows 11 because now uh, Windows 11 was recently released so we're going to talk about Windows a lot and then at the end of the video we're actually going to get into a Windows 11 virtual machine and play with some of the new features and take a look at all that kind of stuff uh, as we get used to using Windows and familiarizing ourselves with the command line. So if you get anything out of the video, I'm doing these videos about uh, three, three, four times a week right now. So subscribe for more of it. You get another video in a few days. Uh, like the video to tell me that you guys like it. Helps us get it out to more folks as well. Um, with all that said, I don't have anything else for you. We're going to get right into the material. So first things first, we're just going to talk about some history and we're going to start with MS-DOS. So MS-DOS, Microsoft Disk Operating System, was an operating system that was a terminal only, a command line only, shell only user interface that users could do thing to, to do similar things to what we do today, like process text documents, that kind of stuff. Uh, but it was obviously not as nearly full featured. Um, after MS-DOS though, we've had about 10 major releases to Windows uh, over the last 30 years. And most recently our current version of Windows is Windows 11 right here in 2021. And so Windows 1 was released in November 1985 and it was the original Windows based on MS-DOS. So essentially you can think of it as just like a graphical program running off of MS-DOS. Um, it was notably really interesting because it relied on, heavily relied on the use of a mouse, which was an input output device that we weren't really using a lot at the time because everything was just a shell, right? It was just you type on a keyboard and that was that. And so Microsoft actually included a game in the operating system called Reversi, uh, which is, I'll put it on the screen right now, and it was the whole point of this game was to get people used to using the mouse. Uh, so once they had actually got people familiar with using the mouse and, and Windows 1 was released and, and used and integrated heavily, um, we get one of the more notable operating systems in the last 30 years, and that's Windows 95. Uh, Windows 95 arrived in 1995 in August, and it brought with it the start button uh, and the start menu, right? So just like we've still got in Windows 11 today, uh, start button, start menu, uh, as features of the operating system, but you actually couldn't drag windows over each other. And so like we've had, we've seen a lot of development w with windows, uh, the actual windows in the windows operating system, uh, moving things around and like snapping and whatever else in the modern day. But back in windows 95, you couldn't even drag windows over each other. Uh, and so very interesting. Um, it was also the operating system where internet Explorer made its debut. And so that's very notable. Um, later versions or revisions of 95 included IE by default uh, and like Netscape Navigator, uh, some other applications. Uh, but 95 was a critical point in the sort of history of Windows. Uh, the next thing we have is uh, sort of considered a low point uh, by many and that's um, Windows Millennium Edition. So right around the turn of the 2000s. Uh, however, this also brought with it Windows 2000, which was the server uh, version, the enterprise version. Uh, and while these were plagued with uh, security issues and other things, uh, the important point here is that it brought automatic updating in. And so as security professionals, this is something that we still find incredibly important. Um, but with Windows 2000 and, and Millennium Edition, we had automatic updates uh, being introduced, which is really important, right? Um, and from that, we actually got Windows XP. And so just like 95, Windows XP is sort of a turning point in the operating system um, development series, right? And it was actually supported for, it was, it was the longest supported operating system in the history of Windows. Uh, it was supported until about 2014, uh, 13 years after t our original release. And we were still getting service packs, right? So service pack three uh, and fixing issues like uh, 08067 that, we, that was very significant, right? Um, but its biggest problem was still security actually. Even though it had a built-in firewall, uh, it was turned off by default. And this led uh, Gates to introduce something called the Trustworthy Computing Initiative and subsequently um, the issuance of service packs. So we didn't have service packs before XP. Uh, and while XP was plagued with the security issues, it was sort of a turning point in Windows history where we saw a lot of security features start to get introduced. Um, it didn't have ASLR though. And so if you're familiar what address space layout randomization is, uh, ASLR was introduced in Windows Vista. And so while Vista was sort of uh, plagued by 
by also also plagued by a lot of security issues uh, and a lot of people just didn't really uh enjoy using vista from like a ui standpoint um they did turn on aslr and vista the other thing with vista from a security standpoint is they introduced user account control um, and uac is a service that kind of interfaces between privileged actions and unprivileged actions but unfortunately in vista it was so heavily integrated into everything that it kind of got users to just get into the mode of like clicking yes to every single pop that they saw and so it sort of defeated the the whole point of having it um so while there were lots of security issues we eventually saw Windows 7, right? And this had slight, slight tweaks to the appearance of Vista. Uh, if you remember, sort of the XP to Vista change was very significant, but the Vista to Windows 7 change was not. Um, it, was, it was faster, it was more stable, easier to use, and it became the operating system that most businesses ended up upgrading to. They, a lot of businesses just skipped Vista completely and went from XP to Windows 7. Um, Windows 7 saw Microsoft hitting Europe uh, with a bunch of antitrust investigations over the pre-install of Internet Explorer, though, uh, because we didn't have the option to to install it if we wanted or not install it if we want. And we actually see a lot of that stuff today with default apps being installed in operating systems. Um, and so now when we uh, install operating systems, we're actually prompted with, do we want to install certain things, right? And you can, you can turn them off. Um, however, uh, or not however, I guess, but the next, next uh, development in the, in the whole Windows history, Windows 8, and 8.1 was one of Microsoft's most radical overhauls to their operating system in the entire history. And it was because they decided to start producing features specific, specifically for computing devices that didn't have traditional mouse and keyboard I.O. Uh, specifically, we're talking about tablets. So the Microsoft Surface was very sort of pivotal around this time. And this is when we saw like bigger tiles in the start menu and a lot of those types of UI integrations that uh, we're, we're totally new and totally different. And a lot of people didn't like this. You know, the full screen start menu, things like that. And people are not a fan of that. I still remember working back at a Staples in high school and like trying to sell uh, Windows 8 operating systems to people, like just tablets with Windows 8 on them and people really struggling to like use them when I was doing demos. Um, and so they actually fixed that Windows 10. When Windows 10 came out, the start menu became smaller. Uh, it was sort of the same kind of start menu as Windows 7, but retained the UI and... Uh, prettiness factors of, of Windows 8 uh, with the tiles. And so it, currently in Windows 10, uh, 10 is still supported at the time of recording this video. Uh, the ninth version of Windows to date uh, after MS-DOS sort of unifies a lot of these features that we've talked about uh, over the years. And so while it is designed to work on a Surface tablet or other tablets, um, it still supports the desktop environment very well, right? So like I'm recording this video on a Windows 10 machine. I've been using Windows 10 for a few years now. Um, I, I personally really like it. Uh, and it's got a lot of these security features that we've talked about over the years. So like, you know, Windows Defender, Microsoft Automatic Updates. Um, service packs are sort of integrated into the update process, so they're not explicit like that anymore, but um, we've got hot fixes and things like that. Uh, ASLR is enabled. And there's certain computing things, uh, like Intel's developing uh, SET, for example, which is a more advanced protection. Uh, but lots of security features that we're seeing and then very recently, uh, we're recording this video uh, on, I mean, October 9th. Uh, technically, Windows 11 was released on October 5th, so just a few days ago. Uh, and Windows 11 incorporates sort of a redesign of the interface, new start menu, some new visual features. Uh, and importantly, Microsoft is now leaning more into the Microsoft Store. And so we've seen a lot of features around the, the store and that kind of stuff. Uh, Windows 11 uh, also... Uh, has this whole concept where you can buy hardware that supports Windows 11. And so what we're talking about is things like uh, processors that include TPM, Trusted Platform Module Chips, uh, for security, for encryption, uh, device encryption, virtualization-based security, uh, hypervisor, protected code, uh, code integrity, so that's HVCI, uh, and then Secure Boot, of course, which is uh, something that some people may be familiar with. And so a lot of these uh, features have been shown to reduce the amount of malware present on these systems or that gets by security features by almost as much as 60%. I mean, I'll include some of those studies in the description if you want to go read those. Uh, but the big thing is just that there are now uh, services of the operating system that are compatible with hardware. And so a lot of hardware is sold as Windows 11 compatible. And that's probably the biggest difference from, from 10 to 11. Now, the only other thing we're going to talk about before we get into actually getting into Windows 11 and looking at the file system is going to be the kernel itself. 
So if you remember back to the Unix video, an operating system has a segment of, of the code, right, a code base that is called the kernel. And it's responsible for the sort of translation between your hardware and the actual operations of the system, uh, doing things like memory management, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so there have been sort of two phases of kernel with Windows. We had the Windows 9X kernel, and that was for things like Windows 95 or 98, uh, and, and ME even. Uh, and this was the heart of the operating system, right? And so it's, it's a incredibly important of the operating system to things like security. The specific uh, difference between the Windows 9 kernel and the Windows NT kernel, which we'll talk about in a second, is that the 9X kernel was monolithic. And that means that the entire operating system is in kernel space rather than being segregated uh, as high actions in kernel space and lower privilege actions in user space. And having a monolithic kernel is, in this day and age, considered a security concern, uh, in most cases. And so in the newer versions of Windows, uh, pretty much all the modern ones, Windows NT, um, XP, uh, or sorry, uh, Windows XP, Vista, 7, 8, 8, 1, 10, 11, all the, all the sort of modern versions of Windows, they all use a new kernel called the Windows NT kernel. Uh, and it stands for, or it used to stand for Windows New Technology. The term has sort of been deprecated at this point. But the whole point here is that now we have a kernel space for high privilege actions and a user space in a separate ring that is designated for us as users when we do things on the system. And this is a huge security improvement because if you compromise a process, you gain the privileges of that process. And so if we compromise user pro processes, we are no longer getting total kernel access, right? Kernel level access to the system. Uh, and so this is, uh, the other thing is NT is available for a few different architectures. It can technically be compiled for uh, MIPS, although I haven't seen that myself. Uh, PowerPC, ARM, uh, and then standard, standard, in a standard context, we will generally see Intel uh, x86 or x86-64. Uh, and so the kernel is a hugely important component of the operating system, and now in the more modern Windows NT kernel, we have kernel space and user space. All right, so now if you have not seen Windows 11, here it is in all its glory. This is Windows, uh, Windows 11 Pro, uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, this is your start menu, your new start menu, right? Uh, so it looks a little bit different. I, I kind of like how it looks. I have not installed this on my main operating, main machine yet. This is still a virtual machine. Um, so we'll see how I, I like it going forward, I guess. But uh, I think this is a positive improvement from what I can tell. Uh, and we're going to use it to talk about the file system. So if I just go to disk uh, management, this is going to open up this console here. This looks the same. Uh, the windows are a little bit prettier, but this whole format here is basically the same. And so we can tell a few things here. We've got a C disk, which of course is virtualized because we're in a virtual machine, uh, but it's effectively the same thing. And if we click properties here, we can see that it is a NTFS local disk, um, some partition information, and uh, that's about all we really need. Uh, a lot of the stuff is going to be just because we're in a virtual machine, right? Um, but NTFS uh, has a few different properties. And so I'm going to put some information in the description if you want to look up what exactly NTFS features are and what, how they're distinct. Um, but in this video, we're specifically going to talk about the actual directory structure. So you will install your operating system on a drive. It's going to create a main partition here, which we see uh, partition zero, right? Uh, and you're gonna have a recovery partition uh, and then a system partition, right? And so this is what it's, it would normally look like. This is your CD drive as well. So this is where we can see our disk information in Windows and where all, all of our partitions are and that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna close out of this and open up the file system. And we're just going to go to this PC, local disk C. And now that we're in here, we can start talking about the different things in here. Um, so you're gonna have some log files in here. Uh, we may not be able to get into this stuff without administrator permission, fortunately, for our admin, um, so we can do that. Uh, but these logs uh, are, are going to be set by audit policy, and this is stuff that you don't need to worry about right now. Um, the next thing, we have program files and program files 86. Program files 86 are going to be for your 32-bit applications, things that are not compiled for a 64-bit architecture, whereas the program files directory without the 86 is where we have all of our binaries that are compiled for a 64-bit, uh, for 64-bit for support. Uh, next, we have Windows and Users. Remember, I said we have like Etsy and Unix. Um, similar types of files are going to be found in your Windows directory. There's a lot of configuration files for the system, uh, like System32 is in here, or, uh, certain utilities like RegEdit. 
uh, notepad, explorer, all, all these different things, right? Um, so a lot of your system stuff is going to be in the Windows directory. And then all of your user data, very importantly, is in users. And so for me, that's this. Um, you're going to have all the standard stuff, just like your slash home in Unix or Linux. Uh, and then, of course, a public directory that is going to be shared between the users. If you don't have administrator permission and you want to share a file with another user, you just dump it in the public directory and then the other user could go grab that from there. Now, for the last portion of this video, I'm just going to open up the command prompt. We can call this a Windows shell. Uh, I'll do system info for you so you can see some of the information about the actual system we're on. Uh, Windows 11 Pro, of course, this is the build information if you're curious about any of that. Uh, we've got some hot fixes and we're just on a DHCP uh, NAT lease. And so that's all the basic information about the system, but specifically what we're going to do here is talk about uh, just getting around in Windows. And so we did this in, in the Unix video as well, uh, but we're just going to, so we're in our home directory, it's going to drop us in our home directory. On Unix, we get a little bit more information in our header here. In Windows, we just have where we are in the system, right? So Unix, we get like who we are and that kind of stuff. Um, to find out who we are, you can do ham, who am I? I'm gonna give you the user. Want a little bit more information, we can do uh, who am I slash all, and this is gonna give us permissions and other things. Um, there have been a few vulnerabilities recently that have relied on uh, some of these being enabled or disabled. And so uh, if we wanted to query for that, we could just do who am I all, and we'd be able to tell whether certain, um, uh, the a vulnerability is a privilege escalation called Rotten uh, Potato, and it is a, uh, it's reliant on some of this stuff. So we can check for, you know, per privilege escalation potentially, and some other things by just checking these permissions here. Um, so just having that who am I slash all is, is uh, potentially useful. Uh, but that's all for that. Uh, if we want to list out the directory, we can do DIR, uh, and now we've got all our, our listings. Uh, we can go into our desktop by doing CD. This is very similar to Unix systems, right? Uh, CD desktop and list that out again, or it'd be dir. I'm used to using Unix, right? Um, so uh, LS for Unix equivalent for Windows would be DIR. Uh, if we want to get some information about the command, we could do DIR slash uh, question mark, which is effectively a help command. Um, we can also just do help, right? And this will give us a variety of different commands we have. Um, I'll go ahead and just make a text file on the desktop. We'll go here and we'll do new text documents and example documents. And then we'll open that up by hitting enter and type some information is in here and just save that out. Control S, close it, close the other. And now if we do a DIR on this directory, uh, we'll see our example files in here. It's got 27 bytes of data. And if we just do type, uh, type type like that uh, and then the file name it's going to put it in double quotes because there's a space in the name and now when we hit enter it's going to just effectively cat out if we were on unix systems that'd be panic cat and type are equivalent uh, and it's going to show you the information in there and so before uh we get out of here before the video ends i'm just going to throw up on the screen uh, right now a comparison chart between windows and unix of the common commands for getting around a system and you'll see for most things uh, Unix beats Windows when it comes to the brevity of the command, like how short it is. But a lot of this, you know, functions are very similar, uh, if not the same. And so hopefully this was beneficial for you guys. Uh, but that's all we got for this section of the video. Thank you guys for sticking with me all the way to the end of the video. If you got anything out of the video, again, would always appreciate a like. Helps me know that you guys like this material. Helps me get it out to more folks. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more of it. I'm doing these videos three, four, sometimes five times a week. And so if you subscribe, you should get another video in just a few days doing a variety of different topics from the operating system security stuff we did today all the way down to, I did a video recently on bypassing paywalls, um, getting around firewalls, all sorts of sort of hacking concepts. So if you find that information useful, subscribe and get another video uh, very, very soon. But with all that said, I appreciate you guys sticking by and I will see you guys in the next video.